what appears to be your attention and interest anyway. <laughs> um, so what I want to do to wrap up was just to sort of show you um, what some of this stuff looks like in, in practice. Um, so this is just a, a handful of uh, buildings that, um, that I've been able to work on and, uh, and, and just try to show you some different buildings, some different building systems and a sense of like what they are and, and how they work. And uh, so uh, this is a, a 1300 uh, story, or 1300 story, <laughs> 1300, <laughs> they're very small stories, that, uh, 1300 square foot um, uh, little straw bale house. Uh, this one I really like because um, the, the owner was, you know, in terms of criteria, uh, her driving thing was local. She wanted everything to be local. Could we build a house? Basically got really inspired by the 100 mile diet and wanted to do the 100 mile house. Um, and what was interesting about that is, like that basically made us do really great in almost all of those categories because nobody makes shitty materials within a hundred kilometers of here. So we basically were, you know, getting local natural materials. And, and so, you know, um, so what we did for this place, so one of her other criteria was she didn't want any straight walls whatsoever. Um, and so straw bale walls are very easy to make wiggly. Um, I have yet to figure out a way to make odd shaped roofs that aren't really sort of clumsy and expensive and, and problematic. Um, so what we did for her was essentially built a, this post and beam frame. So these are just locally harvested cedars, uh, some locally harvested spruce and beams. Um, and we made what looked like a pavilion. So there's just this roof. Uh, and then we made uh, a rubble trench foundation that was the odd shape of the house underneath and then basically built the bale walls on that wiggly foundation uh, up to the ceiling. And so that was a way to sort of make a very simple structural system uh, that gave us a very sort of like interesting and complex uh, layout uh, to the house. Um, it's off grid uh, on a very small system. There's only 500 watts of solar um, and, a, and a, a solar hot water collector. Um, there, there was, a, at the time, there was a, a, um, uh, an early adopter of uh, industrial hemp growing in that area. And so uh, we actually uh, used uh, hemp bales for the walls. Um, and that was, this was the first building that we first started experimenting with hempcrete as well. So um, things like the, the insulation around the windows, the window sills and things like that, uh, we were using hempcrete. Um, had a, a, a sort of interesting grand earth floor uh, system. So the floor base with, was uh, insulated with rocks underneath um, and then rammed earth. And then we did sort of like wooden um, stringers on top of that and a wood floor um, over that system. Um, it is heated by wood. It was the house where we first realized like, oh, this is, you know, <laughs> it's hard for this person to keep uh, a really consistent temperature now that we've made them a really kick-ass house. Um, and actually in the years since, this house is 15 years old now, um, she recently switched actually to a, a propane stove because she just did a, was finding it too hard to, uh, to maintain a constant temperature with the, uh, with the wood. Um, first time that we used uh, clay plasters inside and outside in Ontario. Um, it was a, you know, felt like a, a risk, but a calculated risk, but it's worked out really well. Um, the walls are called, up, the exterior walls are called up extremely well. Um, I showed a slide earlier on one little um, corner uh, that had uh, eroded slightly, but uh, other than that, it's been really solid. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that one. Uh, I guess one of the things we did uh, that was interesting too is that um, all the framing in the bail wall, so everything that makes a door and window opening is also uh, an un unprocessed round. And, uh, and then the, uh, the window sills are actually slabs that we cut out of rounds. Um, so just lots of like, you know, really minimally processed uh, materials in that one. This is an uh, environment center for an organization called Camp Cortha in Peterborough. Um, so this is, uh, they have some property adjacent to Trent University's nature preserve. And so they do a lot with um, 
school groups uh, coming in to uh, sort of use the nature area. And then the building itself uh, is a bit of a learning center in terms of uh, you know, there are truth windows into um, all the, uh, the wall materials and all the systems are out on display uh, inside the building. This was the first building that we used prefab, the prefab strawville walls I showed earlier. So the, um, not the side you're looking at, the, the sort of east and west sides, the structural walls uh, were prefab. Uh, what you're looking at, the front, the rounded part is actually framing with hempcrete. Um, what else is on this one? Clay plasters, line plasters. It has three different roofs. It's got a living roof, a thatch roof, and a metal roof. Um, so one of the really great things about this building is that um, this was Ontario's first potable drinking rainwater system in a public building. Um, and we managed to do that out of sheer naivety um, <laughs> by not understanding what the public drinking water rules were um, and by the building official telling us, oh, if it's a public building, this is Ministry of Environment does this. Um, not us, so don't ask me about rainwater. And so when we asked, started talking to people at the ministry, they were like, well, all you have to do is pass the water tests. And, you know, I don't really care how you get there. I don't think that she in any way imagined that we were going to get there through the rainwater. But uh, so we just did this rainwater system, put our uh, tests in, and it's been working great for uh, you know, since 2009. Um, with one caveat, the first round of tests we sent in came back outrageously high in lead, which, you know, alarms go off at the Ministry of Environment when you have high lead. And then they were like, where is this water coming from? And then they came and saw the rainwater system. And right away it was like, that metal roof is leaching lead. I was like, I don't think so. Like I vetted the metal company there. There's no lead in that roof. And so we did a series of tests of water coming off the roof, no lead, must be your eaves trough. Did things coming out of the eaves trough, no lead. Trace it all the way into the tank. Out of the tank, there's no lead. And yet it gets from the tank into the building and there's lead. So the deal is the little brass fittings in the pecs um, in 2009 were still allowed to have 8% lead content and be CSA approved. And that rainwater is so um, mineral hungry that it, it is dissolving those things as it passes. So I took out, there were 15 brass fittings between the tank and the faucets. I took those out, I changed them for plastic, the lead was gone. Yeah, so. No, no. But anyway, it was interesting that, that it might not have showed up though if we were using groundwater that already had a high mineral content, it wouldn't have been as aggressive maybe yeah. in that brass, it but. So hard yeah, that, well, it's because it's a public, building it would have had to be tested anyway but um so anyway that was that was really interesting but i a the fact that at that time it was still legal to have a lead in drinking water you know components was shocking to me like i had no idea that that was okay um and that and that you know that that water could be that aggressive that just passing through a handful of fittings would be enough to to do that you, you know the square of this building yeah, this one was about 225 a square foot. The first one would be hard to say, like it was well under 100, but there was a lot of like friends and family helping with that one and stuff. So it, it, it's kind of hard to put a real figure to it. Yeah. Um, this is one of my all time favorite buildings. So this is a, a performing arts center in the little town of Maydock, Ontario. Um, I had been to a straw bale conference and gotten kind of inebriated with this guy from France. And we had this sort of drunken, like, wouldn't it be great to build with those big round bales? And we just had this conversation. And then we were working on the design for this and, and the, the, the town was sort of envisioning some sort of circular building. We suggested maybe octagonal to make it easy. And then I was like, that's, where we use the round straw bale columns. And so we did, these are three uh, four foot in diameter uh, straw bale rounds. They're actually hemp straw uh, from the same farmer uh, on an earth bag foundation, um, which was easy. The earth bags are great because we could sort of like make that shape really easily. Um, and so 
In order to do this, we had to go test those columns. So we do a lot of work with Queen's University of Kingston, Ontario. So we built three of these columns in their lab uh, the winter before and, uh, and plastered them up and tested them. And like they held a stunning amount of weight. Like um, we capped the test at 150,000 pounds of pressure on one of these columns with zero movement. Um, and so that was enough for our engineer to feel comfortable doing this. So essentially <laughs> we, made, we made this octagon, we made a wooden beam around it, and then we infilled between them with, with regular bales. Um, and uh, yeah, and we also do a lot, we build a lot of our roofs uh, on the ground next to our buildings. So, um, you know, simultaneous to all of this going on, the roof is being built here and it got picked up and put on. And so we had measurements to see, like, did we get any settling when we put the roof on? It was like nothing that we could measure. Um, so it was pretty cool. That was by far the fastest structural system ever. Like those things were up in about an hour and a half and, uh, and then ready to, ready to take the roof. So that was pretty cool. Um, it also has a lot of neat stuff. It's um, um, uh, got some earthen floors in it, um, uh, some concrete, some straw clay, uh, a green roof over the over this outdoor stage here. Um, yeah, it creates a high PV thing. Um, we use a hemp canvas as the ceiling material in the performance space. Um, it's great acoustics. Uh, so that was a that was a fun one. Uh, this is kind of at the other end of the spectrum <laughs> from that one. Uh, so we got asked by Habitat for Humanity to do a house for them. Uh, they wanted to do uh, do something lead platinum, and so uh, we helped them do that. So uh, here we use the, the prefab uh, wall panels again, um, and uh, yeah, you'll see lots of the, the same items start to to uh, to repeat themselves. Um, but it was it was you know great to be able to see that you know cost wise like that we could do something like that on a Habitat for Humanity budget, which is um, pretty low. And then they were building their sort of typical Habitat house uh, right next to us. So, you know, it was really great in terms of comparison of, of time and budget and, and all those sorts of things. Where did this cost per square foot? This was uh, 125 ish a square foot. How big is it? Did you say? Uh, it's 1400 square feet. Um, and we wouldn't have actually had the opportunity to do this because they just keep building their same house plan with their same materials over and over, but they had had a family in their queue for a long time with a son in a wheelchair. And so they needed uh, an accessible design. And so um, because they were sort of having to redesign from scratch, they were sort of open to us also putting our own materials uh, to that design. And you saw this one earlier. So this is the house that, that I'm living in now. Um, you know, it might get a little bit repetitive <laughs> talking about what's in these things, but um, you know, uh, here we did uh, a Duracell foundation. Um, we used that the porator, those glass beads as the, uh, the sub slab insulation. This was the first time we started using that. Uh, again, the prefab slab walls, grid tied PV. Um, this was our first building to use uh, an air source heat pump as the, as the heating source, which has been really flawless. Um, you know, there's always the question of, you know, does it work down to minus 30? Is the house going to get cold when it gets that cold? It's never had a problem uh, keeping up. Uh, and we actually took out the uh, electrical resistance backup that was built into the unit because uh, I wanted to see how it would work without that. And we've never needed it or put it back in. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that's, that's hard to explain here because it takes in so much, but you'll see it on almost all of these slides is this notion of zero toxins. And, you know, when people come to our open houses, when these buildings first open, the number one thing that people notice is like, this doesn't smell like a new building. <laughs> it's like, that's because it's not off gassing toxic shit. That's <laughs> <laughs> but it's surprising how many people have noticed that right off the bat. That, you know, there is no sort of that new house smell. But what's always interesting is that like they don't necessarily look that different inside. Um, you know, it's really hard to tell the difference between an off gassing wood floor 
and they're not off gassing wood floor. It's like there's nothing visual that cues you into, or like you know, the paint on the wall just looks like paint on a wall. Um, so it's really hard to you know qualitatively kind of see those those differences, but um, but it does make a huge difference. It really is nice um, both to live in and to be the builder of things that I know aren't like, doing me uh, damage to. So this would be suitable for a narrow lot, uh, city lot. Yep. Uh, Thirty-two foot wide lot. Yep. Yeah. yeah, this is a thirty-four, but yeah, yeah. Looking mm -hmm. yeah. for stopping for construction, like and asking questions about this. Like, yeah, we lot. usually we usually during our builds do like a bi-weekly open house tour. Right. So when people stop and ask questions, we just say come back on Tuesday. <laughs> and we'll talk to you then. <laughs> Otherwise, we never get anything done. So. Yeah. 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 Would you have gotten the LBC like you did the building certification if you had went for it? Um, so this was this was one of the ones we tried uh, the living building challenge. So the reason we didn't get the full pedals was uh, the city would not let us treat gray water on site, and so we had no chance of getting the water pedal. Um, and then we started doing sort of analyzing like you know they want at that time it wasn't net positive energy, but it had to be net zero energy and just the geometry of the site again, like getting five kilowatts on that roof was about all we could get without really starting to, you know, go overboard, trying to pack solar onto the thing. And that got us about 80% of our full energy use. So we just didn't, you know, push those two things. But, um, and there were, there was also a funny thing happened. We just, we were going to still try to get the material pedal. And, you know, this is where grading systems can be uh, odd. So, you know, one of the things is you can't have any materials with formaldehyde, but they'll make an exception for structural plywood because currently you can't get any structural plywood that doesn't have formaldehyde. So we could have put formaldehyde, um, uh, FSE certified formaldehyde containing plywood and gotten passed. But what we decided was, well, you know what, let's price out the difference between um, one by eight shiplap pine from this local mill, which is a great local mill. It's water powered, it's been there 150 years. They only get their logs from within 100 kilometers of their mill, like all kinds of great stuff that Living Building Challenge should be super happy with. So we did that and we were like, look at us, no formaldehyde, or local things, not importing plywood from Oregon, et cetera, et cetera. Only to be told that's not FSC certified wood. We can't, you know, we can't do that. So that was that was very disappointing and slightly upsetting. Um, where you know sometimes you just do what you think is right and not what the uh, the, uh, the rating system tells you is right. Uh, so this is a, a an office for the elementary teacher union in Lindsay, Ontario. This is the first building where I started calculating carbon storage, and this is a carbon storing monster. It's sixty three tons. Uh, stored in this building. And that's because we were aiming for passive house, or we were actually certifying passive house on this one. And a straw bale wall actually isn't quite enough to get you to passive house. Um, and so we did a, uh, a two by six frame wall with cellulose and a straw bale wall inside it. It's a system called straw cell that some colleagues in Vermont came up with. Uh, but that means there's a lot of <laughs> plant material in this building. Um, and the, the floor system is cellulose insulated and so is the roof. So um, there's a lot of uh, stuff uh, storing carbon in there. This one is actually net positive. So from their seven kilowatt uh, PV array, um, they're making about 110% of their uh, annual power use from that uh, through the net metering program in Ontario. And this was, you know, once we kind of hit this level, because when we did the straw cell thing, like the efficiency went like even for passive house kind of way up. Um, this was the first and only time we were able to do the whole passive house thing of like, here's the Zender ventilation system and the entire heating for the building are three electric resistance post heaters uh, in the three supply tubes um, going out to the offices. So that's a whopping total of 3,000 watts of uh, electric power uh, heats that entire building. Um, and it was a really interesting sort of like paradigm shifter for me because, you know, if you had told me a year or two before that, 
Chris, you're going to put electric resistance heating in your next building. And they're like, are you kidding? I would never use electric resistance heating. But at, at this level of efficiency, it's like, it's so cheap. Those post heaters cost $150 each, you know? And, and they use so little electricity that, you know, with that PV array, the building is still uh, net positive in its power output. Um, that that was, you know, that was a really good sort of indicator that, yeah, you know, interesting things happen when you when you get to that level. Of, and they kick in and out in minutes, right? Seconds off, yeah. seconds off. Yeah. Your lighting, are you still using high voltage LED or are you using low voltage? Those are still high voltage, yeah. Yeah. I haven't, no, no. How big and how many? Uh, 2,500 square feet. Uh, this was about 360, 370 a square foot. Yeah. And why was it higher? Why was it higher? Um, sort of a, uh, a much higher degree of, of um, basically everything, you know, that the move from, we can get decent triple pane windows in Ontario that are locally made, these are passive house windows from Ireland, you know, the extra insulation, um, plus being a commercial space, you know, some of the materials had to sort of be upgraded, like the doors and, and those sorts of things, um, you know, just sort of commercial grade stuff. Um, it, this picture was taken before this was done, but it, that also included like, you know, there had to be paved parking spots for handicapped accessibility and, you know, some other things that aren't kind of usually in our, our scope. Uh, and then lastly, this is the building that we did in 2017. Um, so we got asked by Ryerson University's architecture department. Um, they had been planning on going to the solar decathlon in China and then decided that that was too much money and too hard to do. Uh, but they had this design team that was really keen and they found uh, this show called the Edit Expo in Toronto, uh, sort of the innovation expo. And so they asked us if we would build uh, this house and take it to the edit expo. And so we had been scheming with the, with the prefab thing for quite a while about how much could we prefab and uh, how could we do prefab better. And so the, the idea with this building was we built it in Peterborough. We then fully, then we dismantled it, took it to Toronto, assembled it for the edit show. It was there for 10 days dismantled it again and took it to a client site and rebuilt it. So, you know, this was looking at how, how do we do that? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, basically the whole building was prefab. So uh, our floor system, the wall panels, the roof panels, um, everything was prefab. It, it's a mix of um, straw panels and cellulose fitted panels, mostly with wood fiberboard as the exterior sheeting. On the other side, we had a couple panels with cork and a couple panels with the microphone. Um, so yeah, and then figuring out, you know, ways that you can put it together and take it apart really easily. Um, so like, you know, if you look at the floor system, we shipped the floor with the hardwood on it. Um, and then where you see these strips, like that's one panel, that's another panel. And so to, to take it apart, all we had to do is take out the center strip, everything came apart, Put it back together, relay the center strip, and it was done. The whole interior was done in um, a pre-finished no formaldehyde plywood. Same thing made it very easy to, you know, a finish that we could uh, take on and off without uh, without really damaging it. Um, we use this really interesting uh, PV uh, called Flextron. It's from the UK. It's a stick down, so you can just like if you look. The top of the roof is a slightly different color than the bottom of the roof, but that's that's the PV array for the building. Um, they're literally like big decals. You peel the back off and you put it onto your uh, standing seam metal roof. And uh, is that way more expensive than our uh, silicone? It's it's more expensive, but you know when we sort of weighed out the cost of like the, the PV units were more expensive, but there's no frames, no mounts. No installation time. That's what you said in the beginning. Yeah. It's not just what it is. Yeah. So I would say it probably washes out pretty evenly uh, in the end. Um, and that's the Lunos? Yeah. So this is this is the, the Lunos ventilator going in, and that's its little uh, screen on the building. That's the Dakin 
um, air source heat pump with one of the two uh, blower heads in it. Um, How well is your air seal on all your joints? I mean, you've got lots of joints. <laughs> so yeah, we, we, dry, dry joints? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the building subsequent to, to uh, putting up got wrapped in, a, in an air barrier. Um, so the, the air seal, the first time we built it was 0.6. The second time we built it was 0.8. And the third time we built it was one. <laughs> <laughs> so it does wear. So it, it, and, and some of that was, you know, especially on the final site, um, when it finally got serviced, you know, we were sort of bringing in water and power and things. And, and you know, because we didn't know where those were going to come in and we built it, you know, there were holes happening that, uh, that didn't exist before. But still, you know, we we're pretty happy with that for a, a building that, that goes together and comes apart like that. Um, yeah, and we sort of shipped it with windows uh, in the panels, windows and doors uh, moved with it once we built it the first time. So, and yeah, if anybody's interested in prefab, I have lots of lessons learned from this one. Um, the biggest one of which was just to go show how it's hard to make your brain change how it thinks. So when we thought about the floor and the roof panels, we made them the whole length of the building, big, long, straight panels. For some reason, when we made the walls, well, the some reason is every time I've made walls before, I've made individual panels and put them together. When we were done, we were like, why weren't those three wall panels one wall panel? Yeah. <laughs> and why on the side, you know, where we had a two-story thing, did we do three tall panels instead of two, you know, long panels? Um, so, you know, that, that was definitely uh, something that, that would change for next time around. It would eliminate the number of seams, the number of crane lifts, uh, just everything would have been easier if we'd been able to think of the wall panels the same way we thought of the roof. Because those elements are not that heavy. No, 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 not definitely not for a crane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, sure, yeah. So yeah, that's what the book that today's stuff was based on looks like if you decide to go get it. And somebody did ask, what's the best way to get that book? And if you're an author, I'm an author, um, if you go directly to the publisher and buy the book, I actually make a better royalty than if you go buy it from Amazon. So authors appreciate it when you go directly to the publisher. Um, we'll send a link. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and I also, um, a lot of the, the sort of, so, this book is very much aimed at, at sort of like helping the designer owner think through all of these things. And kind of the companion book, the one that came first is this one, Making Better Buildings, which is really just all about the materials. So this one breaks down each material uh, a lot more sort of thoroughly and um, does like a little ratings chart for each one. So for all those 10 criteria it kind of shows you what it's good at and what it's not good at. So it, it sort of makes it a lot easier to kind of like compare uh, across materials. Um, Is there a discount when you buy books? <laughs> probably from New Society. Usually if you buy more than one book, they give you a break. Yeah. Um, so just as a wrap up, some, some things like main takeaways that I could think of uh, that have hopefully come across. The first is that there isn't just a right answer, um, you know, you really have to like everything is sort of context and, and criteria specific. Um, being open minded, but also fact based, I think is really important. Like it's easy to get excited about something and then start to like not acknowledge the flaws and the actual like truth about things. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to be open minded, but also make sure that, that you are making sure that it. Uh, you know, these things do what they say they're going to do. Um, you will need help. Um, you know, I've been at this a long time. I can't do this without a really good structural engineer, a really good HVAC engineer, um, some architectural help, a code consultant. Like, um, it's really, it really is a, a team thing. Um, maybe if, if you only take away one thing, maybe this, maybe this is actually it. And that is that it's people who are going to make your building, not the materials and the systems. And when you're making your choices, 
I would way more encourage you to work with, say, the, the installer or the designer or whoever's involved who you really like, who gets your goals, who you connect with, who you trust, than you know, somebody who sells the other thing that you thought was really cool and what you really wanted, but they're a scumbag. <laughs> like, you know, um, because in the end, like the difference between, you know, those actual materials or systems is probably going to be pretty small in terms of your overall quality of life in that building. But your experience and your ongoing satisfaction with things, if you're working with the right people and people who are going to make sure that it works well, going to come back and fix it if it doesn't, like that's way more meaningful than like, you know, you went to all lengths of the world to do hempcrete because damn it, you're going to do hempcrete when there's like a really kick ass, nice framer who would have done you a cellulose and fiberboard building, you know, and you would have liked it uh, then, then, you know, so just really keep that in mind that, that there's always a person associated with uh, all of those things and, uh, and choose them. Um, understanding how the regulatory side thing works. Um, be, go into this knowing that you can't do this perfectly. Like I have a relatively longish list of, I would have done that, should have done that, could have done that better from every building I've done. And I'm 25 years in and a lot of buildings in and like the degree of right is getting better and better, but there are things that just, you know, the, that I won't know I could have done better till I've done them and, you know, um, be okay with that and focus your attention on the things that, that, you know, are going to matter to your quality of life in the building long-term um, so that uh, at least those things are as close uh, to good as you can get them. Uh, finding some joy in the process, um, go into this knowing that if you're a homeowner doing this kind of thing, this is the most wicked emotional roller coaster you might ever ride. <laughs> um, it, it has, it, it, in, in my experience, it has, ended, it has ended more marriages than just the act of having children, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, different role. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite a ride and it's, you know, a, a big, long one or two or three year ride. Um, every, all your money's on the line, you know, it, it, uh, and, and if you don't think that's for you, it's like, don't do it. Buy a house. It might be, <laughs> might be <all> right. <laughs> uh, but at the end of that process, like there is nothing better than sort of like riding out your first snowstorm or rainstorm or something in a house that, you know, you had a real hand in kind of designing and or building um, the satisfaction is in my estimation sort of unparalleled. So um, it's a bit of a crazy ride, but the, you know, the end result, if you do it well, is really worth it. And, um, yeah, with that, I'd like to really thank you guys all for hanging in, even though it's getting dark. Nobody's heads hit the table yet. Nobody's fallen asleep. You've been sitting there a long time. So really uh, appreciate that a lot. Uh, are you getting up to make announcements or? Got a couple of things, but. Okay. So. Um, okay, well, I just, you go first. Go ahead. All right. Um, I wanna thank Chris. And then come have a Chris, how come have a Chris, come have a beer with Chris tomorrow night if you haven't already got your tickets. And if you have a few minutes to stick around and help us, put away tables and chairs, that would be greatly appreciated. That's all I have to say.